So, um, first of all, thank you for, very much for having me here at the Inspire series. It's worked dramatically. I'm already inspired to be addressing this really august intellectual gathering of people from Harvard, you know, a place that my mother thought I will never reach. But you know what? A lot of people have spoken before me and eloquently and described their dreams for India and given uh, figures and facts that l either are skeptical and, like uh, Mr. Wilber says, uh, aspirational. But I'm just an actor, and I'm going to just give you my dream shamelessly because that's the thing that I can do best. And by that I mean when, uh, when we talk of dreams, we have one of our greatest scientists and philanthropists, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, and he said something which is very interesting. He said, uh, dreams are not what you have when you sleep. The true dreams are the ones that don't let you sleep. He said that when you have that dream once, it's a dream. When you have it twice, it becomes a desire. And when you see it for the third time consecutively, it becomes a passion, an aim, and a goal. And that is the passion with which I want to see this fantasy that I have for India 2030. And uh, Abraham Lincoln also uh, was a dreamer. And, uh, you know, but he said, one thing that makes most sense in trying to achieve this goal that I have dreamt for my nation. He said, uh, if I have six hours to cut down a tree, then I will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. There's a great philosophy in that. In this era of instant gratification, we just keep thinking we can achieve all these goals by just tweaking this, treating that. It's not true. I really believe that, um, that a missionary zeal is required to make that quantum change, that can make 2030 the, what I'm dreaming about right now. And just let's look at India as a country. What a unique, unique nation, seriously. Thousands of years old of culture and tradition, uh, many, many invasions being ruled for many years, and we still somehow manage to maintain our identity. We still have somehow have managed to maintain our Indianness our beliefs, our faith, and, you know, yeah, there has been, uh, we have our drawbacks, uh, this, you know, uh, uh, there is corruption, there is violence, there is uh, differences between the different religions and, and sects and castes and everything, but I can't help but think, looking at India, at the geography, that we're not doing really that bad. Look at all the other nations around in the world. Uh, look at our neighbors. Compared to that, there is somebody in India who's doing something right for us to be called a growing economy and being projected as the third largest economy in 2026 and the most educated and young nation in the world. And it's still functional democracy. So let's first accept the fact that there is somebody, some people in India with the right ideas and the ability to lead the nation to where we are today. Under that assumption, under that assumption, we are also very capable of finding very unique solutions to the problems that generally the world faces. Uh, and, you know, and um, one of them, of course, uh, is the fact that we found freedom through nonviolence and non-cooperation. Who would have thought that was possible? We have some other great. No, seriously. I mean, it was as radical a thought uh, uh, then as it is today. And one man in a loincloth with belief and faith and, and complete conviction was able to do that for us. You know, Mahatma Gandhi. And it's an, it's an amazing country of people like Mahavir, Gautam Buddha, and, and Mahatma Gandhi, and, and then Bhagat Singh, who also had a dream. He dreamt then, 85 years ago, that I dream of an India where no infant cries for the want of milk. No youngster um, is deprived of relevant education and no youth goes door to door finding a job. Sadly, it's still a dream today. And I dream of a 2030 when this dream becomes irrelevant. I dream of a 2030 when everybody is so equally satisfied uh, with what they're doing that they're able to actually devote, devote more time back to art and culture, which is another great important aspect of our country. Now, <clears throat> we need to be a, for that to happen, we need to be a healthy nation. And when I say healthy, um, I remember preparing for a film of mine, which I which re released recently, where I had to look like a boxer, and I had these, uh, you know, biceps and triceps that had to be there. So I decided just to work on the parts that is seen outside uh, my clothes. So I was just working out on my biceps and my triceps and my shoulders. But you know what? I suddenly realized 
the strength that I had in my arms and biceps was not actually enough to, for me to look even fit because it is disproportionate growth. It is the kind of growth that will not make you fit or strong, but actually make you look inadequate. And that is what is happening to India today. Everybody says we are the largest economy, the we're going to be the most populated country uh, in the years to come. And, um, you know, with, with uh, uh, economic superpower and supremacy in rocket and space technology, which I am uh, privy to, and then the IT giants and smarter cities. But ladies and gentlemen, I really believe that more than smarter cities, we require smart villages. And this is going to be primarily what I talk about today. You know, a nation is only as strong as its weakest link, and rural India is our weakest link. See, it's important that, uh, that growth and progress uh, goes hand in hand with the villages also getting onto the same train towards economic freedom, superpowerdom, all, all the techn terms that have been coined for a successful country, but that is not happening. The reason being, we, we, we're beginning to ignore them. We're beginning to actually believe that, um, uh, this is a very interesting line that I've uh, 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 you know, found where they say that everybody believes that they know what is required for, for getting the underprivileged and the poor uh, uh, up to speed with the rest of the country, okay? And uh, we always start assuming that this is what they want. This is how we can help the poor and the villages and this is what they need. And we can't be more wrong. Because when you assume, assume, and as the spelling goes, you make an ass of you and me. I'm gonna tell you how that happened to a friend of mine. His name was, uh, he's a very profound doctor, uh, a gastroenterologist, and he got a call from his patient, Mr. Abdul, who said, uh, Dr. Saab, my wife is really, really ill, and she's got a big stomach ache, and she can't sit, uh, and she can't sleep, and she's in big uh, pain, can, can I come and visit you? And he said, yeah, by all means. And like all patients today, he's done his research, he's gone into the internet, and he said, usko ye ho sakta, wo ho sakta. and uh, the doctor said, don't worry, let me handle it. And he checked her out, and he said, she has an infected uh, appendix, so I have to do a surgery, and she'll be fine. The surgery was done, he was fine, and, doctor, and Abdul was a happy man. One year later, he calls back the doctor and says, uh, Sir, uh, uh, my wife has got a stomachache. Uh, please do the appendix operation. She'll be fine. <laughs> uh, so uh, doctor said, uh, Dr. Manoj said, listen, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm the doctor. Let me diagnose what I have to. Please bring her to the, uh, to the clinic and we'll fix it up. He says, no, no, yes, sir. Fix, fix up that operation uh, date. We'll do it in half an hour and we'll be back. Just uh, she needs her appendix removed. So... Now he's losing his patience. He says, let me do the diagnosis, Abdul. Bring her to the uh, clinic. And he's still insisting. And finally, the doctor lost it. And he said, listen, I'm the doctor. And let me tell you that every human being has only one appendix. And I've already taken out the appendix. So please don't tell me how to do my job. Abdul waited very patiently for the doctor to finish with his assumptions. And then he shot back very meekly. He said, sir, I agree with you. Every human being can have one appendix. But a man can have two wives, right? <laughs> so when we start assuming what the, uh, what the rural India needs, we do what I think is most dangerous. In my vast experiences of shooting in really rural Indias, um, you know, and villages and small kugramams, like they call it in Tamil, really small places, I realized, shockingly, that the biggest financial burden for a person of, the, uh, of, of this particular village, would you all be able to guess what his biggest financial burden is? Five minutes? Hey, so I'm going to speak for 20 today. I'm going to reduce the number of questions. I'm prepared. Is that okay? Okay, so can you all tell me, anybody, quick answers, anybody know, which is the biggest financial burden for a man in one of these small villages? Sorry? Health. Theft. Health. health. Okay. No, not health. Not the marriage of a daughter, not education, not, sorry? Liquor. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, but no. Uh, say that again. Dowry, no. 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 Okay, let me, let, me, uh, let me put you out of your misery. No, I'm saying, what does he need financial assistance for? The answer is the untimely death of a relative of a senior in their family. That is the one occasion he can't prepare for. 
There is one occasion where the ceremony demands that he spend a certain amount of money, feed a certain amount of people, uh, you know, use uh, the funeral uh, the expenditures, and that's where he takes the loan, and that's where he gets indebted, and that's where to escape that particular embarrassment and humility of not having a, the ability to perform the function every year as is expected of the, of the Indian tradition, that he decides to leave the village because he's made to feel inadequate. Lord Mikkel had in, in 1735 had spoken in the British Parliament and said the, the only way to rule India is to make the men there feel inadequate. He said, and truly so, that unless he feels that what he has is, is lesser than what others have, you will not be able to rule him. And within a very short period, they proved themselves right. The rural India today is feeling inadequate. They're feeling like they're not even part of our country. And what happens with that is, they start then looking at opportunities in villages and saying better education, better health, better lifestyle, and no humility for not having performed the funeral properly. They decide to give up who they are and move uh, to the cities. And who they are is what is more important for us to understand. Who they are are actually the timekeepers and the bookkeepers of our deep-rooted traditional culture and stories. You know, uh, the, you should see how tradition and culture flourishes in a happy village in India. We don't have psychiatrists uh, 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 as a big fashion thing in India, and they still manage to maintain a great level of sanity. You know, there's a great... Uh, there's a great uh, phrase in, uh, from the poem If by Rudyard Kimpling where it says, um, dream but not make dreams your master, think but not make thoughts your aim. Um, meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. It's very easy to say it, but how do you treat those two imposters just the same? The answer lies in the tradition and the culture and the books and the epics that are so prominent and predominant in our country. The, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Quran, the interpretation of that in the subcontinent, the, 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 the Bible, the Guru Granth Sahib, the granny stories. And you know how to handle the diversities and the setbacks, and you're able to sit back, assemble, reassemble yourself, come back and fight with the same glory again. And we don't give him, when you don't give a, a villager that, you're depriving him, we're depriving ourselves of what I think is one of the most important survival tools uh, in today's world, which is the culture and tradition. So I dream of a 2030 where rural India is as developed as the rest of the world, was as um, uh, aspirational as the rest of India, and where, where the villager uh, is provided with the same opportunities as it is available in the cities. And after a hard day's work, a villager is actually able to come back, sit down, have a drink, put his feet up, and start thinking about art and culture and poetry. That would be a dream that I have for 2030, a practical dream that I have for 2030. <laughs> And the dreams that your parents and my parents had when uh, we were in college, urban middle class, where everything revolved around the boy studying hard, getting into a technical college of a repute, and then getting into a reputed management college, and finally, the green card. <laughs> and if it was the girl, then it was a spouse with a green card. <laughs> I dream of a 2030, where students the world over will dream of a blue card will dream of having once actually come, come to India and study and imbibe the knowledge that we have as a nation. It used to be true. We were the first university in the world. Nalanda was a university where people came in from far and wide. So it's not a, it's not a pipe dream. It is, it's a practical dream that I have. And I think that's easily, easily uh, attainable. And finally, uh, before I wind up, I think a dream of a 2030 where we have a meritocratic electoral base which selects its leaders and whose leaders believe that it is more important to serve with, to, to, with a missionary zeal to serve the nation rather than rule it. You know, there, there is this, another stanza from the same poem which says that uh, if they have the ability to talk to the crowds yet keep your virtue, walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither good friends nor foes can hurt you, yet all men count with you but none too much. If only the politicians understood the gist of that line, we would have a progressive country by 2030 where we'll all be proud of not just the way the country is running, but also uh, um, about, uh, uh, proud about our politicians. And finally, you know, I'm an actor. And the dream that I have for myself is that in 2030, I'm as relevant, I'm as handsome, hopefully, but uh, uh, <laughs> 
if age was to catch up, then they probably would have mapped my face by then and used technology to make me look as young or old as the role desired me to look. And I'm still able to romance the pretty young things that will be part of the industry in 2030. <laughs> well, I see that's got many guys going. Yeah. And finally, as an actor, I'm used and prone to, uh, to dialogues. I love to speak dialogues. And I've, I suddenly, I recently found a, a line that blew me apart, and I thought it was a phenomenal Hindi film dialogue, where this great gentleman has said that whatever I am today and all the achievements that have been, that has been possible by me and what will eventually also be possible by me in the near future is all because of my angel mother. <laughs> Do you know who said that? Do you know who said that? Shockingly, Abraham Lincoln. So I dream of a 2030, where every Indian says the exact same thing about his mother, and not just about his mother, but also about his motherland. And also, <laughs> for the sake of prosperity, about his mother-in-law. <laughs> but hey, ladies and gentlemen, what do I know? I am an actor. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And